My name is Mark Medwed, and the Program Manager at the ACPE. Today is the first installment of our webinar series about the job search process. Our topic today is Preparation, the Foundation for a Successful Job Search, and is presented by Richard Thorne, the President of Thorne Consulting. The webinar is being recorded and will be available for playback from the ACPE Academy webpage. In addition, a copy of the PowerPoint will also be available for viewing. At the conclusion of the presentation today, there will be an opportunity for you to submit questions. When you move your mouse on the screen, you will see a Q&A button. Click on the button and type your question. Please know that depending on the number of questions asked, it may not be possible to answer all of them as part of the webinar. It is now my pleasure to introduce our presenter, Richard Thorne. Hi everyone, welcome. Good afternoon or good morning, I guess, depending on, on where you are. Um, it's really a privilege for me to, uh, to be with you today and, and have an opportunity to, uh, to share with you. I am, um, for some of you who may not know my name, I'm a, I'm a headhunter. So I specialize in placing individuals in spiritual care and CPE leadership roles and have been doing that now for almost 10 years. And part of what we, was discovered along the way was that um, while in CPE there tends to be a shortage of talent, oftentimes for some of you who may be seeking roles as chaplains, it's, it's the opposite of the opposite equation where there's an abundance of applicants and unfortunately not an equal abundance of positions. We will uh, focus largely today on preparation. I guess I'd liken that a little bit to um, sort of taking introduction to anything kind of course. It's, it's not the flashiest of, of things that we'll talk about, but hopefully you'll go away with the idea that, yeah, this is pretty critical and it really is the foundation for everything that follows, including hopefully your, your successful landing of the type of job that you really want to have. Um, in addition to the PowerPoint, um, you, you may have printed or have received three other handouts. If you have them, great. If, if you don't, I'll, I'll reference them. If you need them later, um, you can certainly email me and I, I will send them to you. What I would tell you too about today is a, a couple of things. One, if something makes sense to you and you want to keep it, do. If you think it's the dumbest thing you've ever heard, just forget it and move on. It's what works for you works for you. If it doesn't work or doesn't feel right, just forget it. Um, job search in general is, is more of an art than a science, and um, you need to use what's comfortable and you feel works well for you. I'd like to um, actually begin now by uh, reading you a little story. Some of you may have heard this, others of you perhaps not. It's called The Story of an Eagle Living with Chickens, or I just call it The Chickens and the Eagle. Once upon a time, at a large mountainside, there was an eagle nest with four large eagle eggs inside. One day, an earthquake rocked the mountain causing one of the eggs to roll down to a chicken farm located in the valley below. The chickens knew that they must protect the eagle egg. Eventually, the eagle egg hatched and a beautiful eagle was born. Being chickens, the chickens raised the eagle to be a chicken. The eagle loved his home and his family, but it seemed his spirit cried out for more. One day, the eagle looked up in the skies above and noticed a group of mighty eagles soaring. Oh, I wish I could soar like those birds. The chickens roared with laughter. You can't soar like those. You're a chicken, and chickens don't soar. The eagle continued staring at his real family up above, dreaming that he could be like them. Each time the eagle talked about his dreams, he was told it couldn't be done. That was what the eagle learned to believe, and after time, the eagle stopped dreaming and continued to live his life as a chicken. So the, the moral of the story, quite simply, as you're out there doing job search, is a lot of people will tell you you're a chicken, 
and you can't actually do it and you can't achieve what it is that you'd really like to be doing. Remember that you are an eagle and that you really truly are looking to soar. So when it gets tough, if visualization is something that looks that works for you, perhaps think of the eagle and not the chicken. One of the um, one of the things too to keep in mind, maybe just in terms of removing some of the uh, some of the mystique sort of from from the whole job search process, is to keep in mind that really as as we go through today and and the, the subsequent weeks that much of what you do every day, although it may be labeled differently and the activities may be somewhat different they actually are very similar to the kinds of things that you, you would do in a job search. If we think about, for example, today where we really talk about planning and preparation, think about how your day typically starts. Perhaps it's with a team meeting, meeting with, with staff or managers on various floors to find out who needs what. So you're, you're beginning, you're planning, your preparation. When you see what needs to happen, you sort of figure out your day. And it's the same kind of activities, really, that you do um, when, when, you're in, when you're in job search. And then you get into perhaps recruiting and networking. So maybe you're on the floor talking to some of the staff to see who needs what, perhaps getting a sense of what might be going on in the room before you go inside, something like that. But again, it's the same kinds of things. It's like, okay, I'm, I'm doing my research. It may be a different kind of research, and I'm doing my networking. I'm talking to people who can better inform me about the kinds of things that may be needed. And then you actually do the work, or in this case, do the job search. And then you follow it up. So again, documenting in some ways what's occurred, and what you're going to do next based on whatever those, those particular responses were that you received. So that's, that's it. Um, it's just as simple as things that you do every day. The difference, again, is it's labeled differently. It's a bit of a different environment. Um, what we, again, what we'll talk about today in terms of preparation, in my opinion, key to your success. You can try to skip it. Um, but I think you'll find that in the long run, it makes the process much, much more difficult, perhaps even, even much more frustrating. And one, one of the ways to begin to think about, um, really what, what it is that, that you're going to do is to, to start with the, with the end in mind. In other words, before you even begin looking looking for work, figure out what it is you real what it is you really want. What type of employer do you want to work for? What kinds of what kind of environment do you want to be in? What kinds of people do you want to be relating to? And have a good understanding of what it is that you would like to be doing and the kinds of environments that you'd like to be doing it in. That will help you as different things come along to make a, a quicker decision about is this something I want to pursue or isn't it? It may also help you longer term to look and go, here, here's where I am, here's what I said I wanted. Is what I've said I wanted, has that changed? Or if it's the same, how do I keep moving toward it? Because again, some of this may happen in a sequence, it may not happen all at once. You may kind of, in the baseball analogy, I guess hit singles to get a run versus, versus getting a home run. So decide what you really want from your career. Then you want to look and say, based on what I want, actually I'll do it this way, based on what I want and then going down to the bottom sort of, and based on and where I want to be, that is getting from where I am to where I want to be, what is it that I'm missing? So, so for instance, a real, sim a real simple example may be that I, am a, I would love to be a staff chaplain at UCLA in Los Angeles. 
but maybe I, I'm not sure what it is that they would look for. What, what might they look for in candidates for staff chaplain roles that may be different than, than, other, than other organizations? So I can, I can do a couple of things pretty simply. I can say, okay, so one of my actions, one of my get there pieces, if you will, would be to simply go on their website and see what I can learn about their spiritual care department see what kind of language they use, see how visible they are on the website, keep my eye open perhaps for job postings. And this one's a little tricky at this stage, but the other thing that I might consider doing is calling the director there and asking if they would be willing to do an informational interview. And that simply means that I wouldn't be going there looking for work. What I would be doing is going there looking for information. And then not being able to use that immediately there, I'd have to sort of delay potentially and use it some, somewhere else. But the idea again is that you figure out where it is you want to go, figure out what you need to, to achieve if there are gaps, how do, how do I overcome them, and then what do I need to do to actually narrow, narrow those gaps. The other thing to keep in mind there is to make sure that those gaps are real. In other words, make sure that you're giving yourself full credit for what, what you have. And it may be as simple as somebody saying, we need you to be board certified as a chaplain. And at this moment in time, perhaps you're not, but maybe you're board eligible. So don't look and go not board certified, but say, I'm, I'm board eligible and here's the, and I would develop the plan for how I would and when I would be able to become board certified. Again, part of this whole visioning process is alluded to in the uh, Seven Habits of Highly Effective People, where, where Stephen, Stephen Covey has said, all things are created twice, first in the world of the mind and second in the physical world. Most failures fail in the first creation. In other words, we don't actually create it in our minds. Take time to think about it. Daydream or meditate on your desires. And again, sort of rehashing what, what I mentioned before, some of the things to keep in mind is what would your work environment look like? Who are you interacting with? What sorts of impact or influence or support are you providing um, through your work? And what gives you a sense of pride or accomplishment? Um, what, what kind of recognition do you want to receive? So what kind of culture do you want to be in? And, and what, what would you like to see from that? And also, what sort of work-life balance might you be looking for? What sort of schedule flexibility? So, for example, if I pick, again, UCLA, it's part of the state government, if you will. So they have 13 paid holidays. <laughs> so if time off is a big deal to me, well, that may, that may be a good place to be. Um, as you think about getting there, one of, one of the things that you can consider using would be the idea of SMART goals so that you actually think about what some of those activities and things are that you're going to accomplish and, and set them up in a way that you can you put some thought and energy into them. And so that simply means um, in terms of SMART, be specific. And so part of that would be not wordy, and in a sense, hopefully, things that you are fairly easily recalled. So just a sentence or two. Um, where you can, make it me measurable. What's the outcome that I want? So again, if I were looking at that informational interview um, kind of idea, my preferred outcome may be a face-to-face -face conversation of, say, a half an hour with someone. What I, my, my secondary or plan B may be 15 minutes with somebody on the phone, and I want to do that within a certain period of time, whether it's a week or two weeks or whatever it may be, so that that actually becomes some, something that I look at and, and work toward. The other thing um, to, keep, to keep in mind is, is that the goal is actually acceptable. In other words, it's consistent with, it, it's consistent with your values. 
if, if it's not something that you really believe in or, in fact, that you really want or want to achieve, don't make it a goal. All you, all you may do is frustrate yourself and go, gosh, I was going to do this. I've not done it. And then, and then we start to kind of beat ourselves up around it, and that leads to nowhere good. Um, you want to be realistic, but at the same time, perhaps set the goal in a way that it, it might stretch you. Um, if you think, gosh, I'd like to have it done in two weeks, maybe you set it and say, okay, I would like to have this done in 10 days or something like that. Um, and then just set a target date for when it will be achieved, and that becomes sort of part of your plan. The idea, again, that I'll suggest to you as you're searching is that you dedicate some amount of time regularly. If it's every day, great. If it's every other day, great. If it's primarily on the weekends, then that's what you do. But really set aside some time for things to happen because part of what, again, you're wanting to do is to gain momentum. And if you do things in fits and starts, what will happen is basically that will be the process. It's sort of like they'll, you know, you'll have some energy, something will start to move, it stalls, and you're back you're basically back to starting all over again. Um, and that's, that's unproductive in, in the long run and would also be very frustrating to you. Um, the, the, one of the things, too, to, to keep in mind is that for the most part, you're responsible for motivating yourself. So you, you have to be the person that provides you with in, inspiration and provides you with positive attitude. And as we get further into some of these things, particularly as we talk about interviewing in the, in the third week, if, if you're not there, just check yourself and be careful sort of what things you're doing when based on how you're how you're feeling. If you've just had a really positive experience, oftentimes that's a good time then to move forward and try something else. There used to be, a, probably they probably still say it, but in, in the insurance industry, they would always say the best time to sell a policy is after you've sold a policy. In other words, I come and deliver my, the new policy to you. I should be right away trying to sell you the next one. And it's sort of the same thing here. If, I, if you've had a positive in, out experience with someone, um, and are feeling pretty good, not a bad time to knock, knock on another door. Um, not, a, not a bad time at all. So manage, manage yourself and your, and your time well. Another thing that may sound a little bit odd, but may be true, is to acknowledge your fears. If there's something that's just frightening to you, you know, either don't do it, figure out perhaps how to take it in a smaller bite, or or de decide that there's maybe that scenario where you could use or would, or would appreciate some support. Um, apply your best self-control and self-discipline. That can be helpful. Again, thinking about the target date, you may want to pay pay attention to those. Do the most important things first. In other words, if you, um, if it's like, boy, this actually could lead to something versus this would be a comfortable conversation, unless you're not feeling like you can do it, deal with the thing that would have a chance to actually produce for you. Now, the one thing I'll say, just because I'm thinking of it at the moment, that is maybe not exactly on that. But as, as you think about interviewing and you think about places that you'd really like to work, what I would suggest to you in that regard is that you interview where you don't want to work first. In other words, pick two or three places that you're like, well, I really wouldn't be that interested in working here, but they're willing to interview me. Take the interview. Practice. Learn, learn the kinds of questions that people are asking. Learn what you, what you don't know, perhaps reinforce some of the things that you do know and are able to contribute, and take it from there. So some practice interviews, not a, not a bad thing to do at all. Um, you have a, um, you may have, I guess I shouldn't say you do, I don't know if you do. If you don't, you can either email me uh, and I'll send it to you, but there's a, um, 
Another thing, just sort of as, as part of your preparation that you might look at is um, send out a, a, a tools and tactics worksheet. And on there is this huge long list of stuff that um, can all potentially be components of a successful job search. And the expectation would be that you would literally do all 29 of those things. Um, and be best if you had them done by tomorrow. I'm just kidding, of course. So some of the things over the next few weeks that we'll, we'll get into and some that we've already gotten into today would be the idea of um, clarifying your time frame and available resources. In other words, there it's like, when do I, do I need to have found work and what do I have available to me to sustain, to sustain myself in the interim? Uh, necessity can sometimes dictate what we do. Um, set and confirm your vision. That's back to what we talked about before with um, with the goal and the and the gaps in getting there. Uh, another thing that will I'll introduce you to at the moment and be part of preparation, um, and that would be cart stories. C A R T stories and you, some of you may have different acronyms that you use but simply put and we'll get into more detail with this at a later time C, C stands for circumstance A stands for action R for result and T for tie-in so these these if you develop them and develop them well and again in my opinion as part of your preparation can really become differentiators for you because you're going to be able to illustrate what it is you do, how you do it, and, and what's be, what happens because of what you've done um, in, in those card stories. So that's something that we'll, we'll get into further next week. We'll look at resumes and, and cover letters. And then um, we'll also talk a bit later on down the line about applying online and, and following up with people as, as part of the the interview process. So, I guess. <laughs> yeah. So we really get we if we kind of look at what's what what you know right now is you have some idea probably that you've begun thinking about a vision. You've begun giving yourself some sort of thought as to what are some of the, the tools, what are some of the tactics that perhaps that perhaps I need to help me get from where I am to where, I, where I'd like to be. Um, and you be, hopefully begin to get a sense that it's not likely that this is just going to sort of somebody's going to sprinkle some magic dust and poof, it happens for you. Although I did have an incident once where somebody called me uh, I think really the, the day the, the day that they went through a workshop similar to this, but in person, on their drive home, they got a call from somebody for an interview. So I was like, man, I guess we did really well there. And they actually wound up going to work for the, for the organization. Um, and, and then the idea again is be consistent and be persistent as, as whatever that sort of means for you. And where it all starts, that's sort of just groundwork, general information for you. Now, as, as the slide says, you really get into what may seem very simplistic, but what which most of us don't do well. And that is acquainting yourself with yourself, actually knowing yourself. Chances are most of you very much undervalue and are very much unaware of what it is you really do and you have more of the attitude oh shucks it's just ministry it's just me it's just a job however you however you might think about it and that may be nice and that may be some idea of humility or something like that <laughs> it doesn't play very well when you're sitting across from a potential hiring manager and uh, and hoping to separate yourself from from the crowd so you really want to get to know yourself. 
um, and understand what it is that you do day in and day out. Um, what is it that you do in, in your work that makes you unique? What makes you different than anybody else who's doing the same work? And within some of that, as you can kind of put on a potential employer hat, you look and go, what, what of these things might be of interest to somebody who may consider hiring me? Um, and what's not going to happen probably is that it's not going to pop into your mind in an interview or if it doesn't show up on a resume, for example, people will not assume that you have it and just forgot to mention it. So th this is really getting your own personal inventory squared away, getting to know yourself. And it's a little bit, I guess, like studying for a test. There's all of this stuff that you begin to be, be you become aware of and recognize that you do and have done. And then you begin to sort of sift through it once you built the inventory, you, you can begin to sift through it and say, okay, now which of these things are meaningful? And depending on the position and the time, different things may be meaningful at different times. It's not necessarily all, always going to be um, the same things. And again, again, this is a little weird for me because it's like, okay, I have no idea what's going on out there. But I'm going to reference another handout and I'll do it in a way that if you don't have it, we, you, we can we'll kind of work around it. Because this is a part of where I'd actually like you, if you can, engage yourself and, um, and begin, begin to do, to do a, little, a little bit of work. So there's a, another handout that just starts out. It says name and address at the top, and then it's underneath that summary of experiences. But if, if you go down or actually use a separate sheet of paper, um, it will talk a, a little bit about the idea of work history. Richard, nobody has the handout, so we, we'll, okay. we can get the people out first, but they don't have it. Okay. So what, what I would like you to do um, is to just take a minute and whatever your current job or job title is, just write that down. And, and then write down one thing that you do. So for example, I'm a resident chaplain. And if it were me, I, if I were looking for a staff chaplain job, I'd flip those and call it chaplain resident. And so what's one of the things I do? Well, I, I visit patients. Okay, so that's, a, that's an explanation. Now, now what I would ask you to do is to, is to break that down further and to say, okay, so what's actually involved in patient visits for me? What, what is it that I do? Do I review the notes? Um, do I primarily take referrals? And then what do I do? Do I just kind of walk into a room and see what's happening? Do I prepare myself? But really think through what all what all is involved in that. So you could really not that you get to this level of detail with someone, but that you could describe that to someone who really knows little or nothing about what that would be like. And then with within that, the next the next part, and so you do, you really would you do that for. Um, for as many different aspects of, of your job as you can think of. So it's sort of like, what are all of the, what are all of the duties? What are sort of those day-to-day -day responsibilities that I have that I do, that I do fairly routinely? And chances are you'll also identify some that you take for granted. Um, and again, it's, it's, it may be in some of those subtle areas that, you really begin to separate yourself from other other folks looking for the same kinds of positions that you are. Once you've identified those things and identified the basic functions or activities involved, 
then you, then you want to take a look at those items. And so this is the second thing. If you've got one down and if you've broken it down a little bit, then look at look and see if you can to say what 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 did I accomplish? What's because I'm doing this activity, what's changed? And it may be that that typically you're able to leave people in a calmer space than they than they they were when you when you got there. Um, it may be that you are are good at getting insights from people in terms of their sharing with you that you're able to share with the staff that helps helps people in their in their overall healing process. Um, it may be that you're particularly good with family members. Um, it may be that you're just a really good listener. So don't don't make it don't overcomplicate it. Don't overthink it. But really look and go because I do this. What's different? What's what's actually happening? And it's 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 in whatever those results are that that your value is. Many people are going through the same kinds of activities that you are. They're not necessarily getting the same results. And very simply put, employers are looking for people who can produce results. The the crass way of thinking about it, and it's a little bit difficult when you when we think in terms of spiritual care, but it's beginning to apply more and more. Is that there's the old saying that says em, employers are looking for two things when they hire somebody. They own that is people who can make the money or people who can save the money. And again, there are lots of stories and testimonies, anecdotal evidence, I guess, that good spiritual care can definitely save organizations money and the way reimbursements work in these days, it can actually help make money. The other way or another simple way to look at it is particularly the person that you would be reporting to and others perhaps are looking for something very simple that actually we all look for throughout life and that would be peace and happiness. So in other words, <laughs> When I'm hiring you, I want to know that you're the person that's going to bring me peace and happiness. You, I can just turn you loose. I'm not going to have to do much. There's not going to be a lot of negotiation or argument or we need to change this or that or the other thing. But it really is, here's your role. Here are your areas of responsibility. If something's getting in the way, let me know. But otherwise, I'm trusting you to do a good job. That's that's what an employer is looking for is you're the solution to whatever the pain is they don't they don't want the pain they don't want to be responsible for the pain they want you to be responsible and, and take care of it and so in an interview and really getting to know yourself you're able to better address for somebody how you can do that so again not the most exciting thing on the planet, but preparation really is the key. And the more attention that you give to thinking about what it is you do, how you do it, how you do it differently, and what's occurring because of that, the, the better you'll be able to put together a resume, the better you'll be able to put together a cover letter, and certainly the, the, the better you'll be able to interview, not only in terms of your information, but because you know you're well prepared, um, you'll have a sense, I would say, of, of, of calm and confidence that you can pretty much handle whatever someone throws your way. Um, other things to just sort of think about as, as you get into the preparation phase, in addition to thinking about positions, um, so sort of take, take that experience, if you will, of looking and going, okay, what are the various activities or responsibilities I have? What are some of the outcomes from those responsibilities? And if, if you're struggling with the outcome piece, ask people. So I might ask some of the staff nurses, for instance, that I work with and just say, you know, 
your your experience of me or things what what sort over the time I've been with you or working on the unit what what kind of contributions um, would you say I've made what what would my value what how would you assess my value to the unit and if there's something that's not a positive I I want to know that too but I'm particularly looking for things that help better differentiate how people see me and how they see my skills and then I'll check it out and see if I think what they're telling me is in fact something that I that I do think I do well uh, again watching yourself to not be too humble about it um, and if somebody says wow you're really good at this go wow cool thank you um, so you want to do that other parts of the preparation um, Make sure you've got titles right. Make sure you've got employer names right. Um, and with that as well, acquaint yourself, if you don't already know, acquaint yourself with the organizations that you, you're working with or you've worked with in the past. In other words, are we a 465-bed teaching hospital level one trauma center with a level three NICU? Something like that. And again, Part of that is as you move further down the process, you're able to put things in context. But if you haven't looked them up, if you haven't done your research, it's probably not going to magically fall and fall out of your mouth when you're when you're in an interview. And if you can come up with those kinds of things, again, no, because not everybody knows everything about every hospital, and in some cases may be somewhat surprised as one and my thing isn't a match to be able to talk about similarities or the differences in how they would play things as well. If you haven't thought about it likely to come up once they're or in the middle this is what I've I suggest to people sometimes is you just actually carry a pad around some of you are more technologically savvy than me so pad and paper may or pen may seem odd to you but um, and just as you go through a day, sort of jot down the things that you do and, and, and sort of the, the experiences that you have and where you think you've, you've made a contribution. Um, and, and just kind of note those for a little while. And if nothing else, you'll be pretty impressed with all that, you, with all that you've done. Um, so again, to kind of re Reevaluate, restate, I guess. Know what makes you unique and may be attractive to potential employers. It's that uniqueness, it's not the sameness that makes a difference. Um, be able to clearly and concisely describe what you do to other people. That can be a bit of a challenge. Not everybody that you speak with is necessarily going to be a spiritual care person. They may or may not have a clear idea what, what you do. And if they don't, and you can't explain it, they won't listen. And they probably won't ask follow-up questions. They'll just move on to the next person. And that's how the process goes. And I have people in employment, sophisticated employment people, regularly tell me, I have no idea what this is. I do staff nurses, and I happen to get this thing, and I don't, this, I don't know what this is. I don't know what good people look like. Um, Know what's changed. This is what's your contribution. Because of the job you've done, again, what's different? Um, and this is what we just talked about as well, the background worksheet, and, and really getting into this analysis of yourself and recognize that it's a dump and that editing comes later. So try to shut down the monkey mind or whatever critic it is that's in your head and simply move through um, getting getting the data so you're looking at your work experiences you're looking at what your qualifications are 
you're looking at, and that, that could be education, your work history, descriptions of the organization. Um, again, what we talked about and really hit on was the duties and responsibilities and, and, then, and then the accomplishments. Um, and then as you get all of that and you've dumped it and it begins to become clear and you go, wow, I'm quite a bit more amazing than I thought I was, then just ask yourself, what else? Is there something else that might actually be there that I'm, that I'm missing? Or another way to think about it is, if I were the hiring manager, what would I want to know? What would make someone attractive to me? What kind of person would I consider hiring? And just to give you an idea, because part of what I do in, in my role is get to know people and their backgrounds better. Um, almost every time I get into sort of what I'll call a, a, a background call where we'll sort of go through this kind of dump together, Within a day or two, people will call me back and say, wow, I didn't really, I never thought about all of this that I did. But they'll often always also send an email or, or call and say, hey, I thought of something more. So begin thinking about it now, because as you do, it just, it just keeps getting better. And an example, I was talking to someone, I think just you know, a day or two ago, and they had been in a job for 10 years, about three years ago. And I said, so what what's something that you contributed what's different in the organization or in the department because you were there and they had no answer and as a potential employer while I can understand what you've done if you have no answer to contribution about the only thing I can assume is you didn't make one and I'm sure that's not true but again just reinforcing <laughs> Think, think it through. Do, do, your, do your homework now. Study yourself. Get to know yourself now because it's, it won't get any better um, or any easier as you, as you go down the road. And the other thing as you become familiar with yourself to do is don't be shy about taking full credit for it. This is the time, again, when you want to, when you need to. Um, you can say things about what you've achieved, and if they're factual and, and they're said from a genuine place, um, people, people, will under, people will understand it. Because the alternative is if you don't, they will make the assumption that it doesn't exist. And that's just the way it is. If you don't bring it up, then we'll, they'll assume you don't have it. Okay, so that as far as the formal presentation goes, that, that is it for today. That is the, the focus on, on preparation. Um, next, next time we'll be looking at resumes and cover letters and content and, and format for those. And if you have any questions, now is the time, I guess, to submit them and uh, we'll, we'll address them. This, this obviously, is, it's for you, so any questions that you may have, may relate to today's topic. It may be something that you're facing right now, um, given where you might be at in your own job search. Again, as a reminder, if you move your mouse on the screen, you'll see a Q&A button. And if you click that button, you'll be able to type a question in. Okay, so we don't see any questions coming up, but oh, here we go. Okay, so the question about the information dump, yes, we're gonna be posting the forms that Richard referenced onto the website. 
where you'll be able to also access the recording and the PowerPoint slides of this webinar. It'll be under the ACP Academy page on the website. So that will be accessible to everybody later this week or early next week. And if there are no other questions, we'll go ahead and wrap up. Okay, Richard, you have a couple of questions. Okay. So first question is, what is a good way to prepare for an information interview? Um, well, at, at the risk of oversimplifying it, you want to decide what, informa what information is it that I want and, and really stick to that. Um, so in other words, if, if, I'm, if I'm going to schedule a couple of informational interviews, which I would pretty much recommend that everyone do, particularly if it's a, if it's a new profession or you haven't interviewed for a while, um, I, wanted, I want to think about people that I would like to do that with, and I would want them to be people that I respect, probably not people that I would, that I would potentially be very interested in working for, only because in, a, in the context of an informational interview, it is what it says it is, that is, I'm only going asking for information. I, I would like to set something up with someone, and my preference would be to do it in person. If you need to do it over the phone, that can work too. And then what I want to do with them is to talk a little bit about the kinds of things that they would look for in candidates that they might potentially hire. What are some of the types of things that they would like to hear in an interview about what a candidate brings in terms of, of background? I would probably be asking them some of, the, some of the questions that people tend to not answer well. In other words, what, are there a couple of questions that are sort of standard for you that people tend to not not have a good response or perhaps have no response. Um, and a real simple one is that it used to be, I haven't heard it so much recently, when people would be interviewing, they would often say, and what is it that you do for self-care? And more often than not, the CPE supervisors I was working with had no answer. <laughs> and in that, uh, it was sort of game over because it was like, wow, if you can't take care of yourself, we're not sure how you can take care of anybody else. So those would be some of the things. I would also, again, it depends on the relationship, but if things are going fairly well, I sort of, you can take it in grades. The next thing I would do is, is ask them perhaps to take a quick look at my resume and see if there are, if they have any suggestions about what might change um, or be done differently, or if this were to come to their inbox, what would they think of it? Um, and then I might ask them, and again, I want to be real careful because this gets a little bit into the gray, about potential in their organization as far as employment um, and how they go about filling positions if they were to have openings. And I want to then close it off by asking permission to stay in touch with them. So in other words, would it be all right with you, you know, down the road? if I were to check with you to see if perhaps you are hiring. And then the last thing I want to do is I want to offer my help to them. So while I've asked them for a lot of help, at the end I actually want to close it out by saying, is there something that I might do for you? Nine times out of ten the answer is no, but the fact that you've offered it would be unique. Um, and if there is, you'll do your best to, to provide for them. Um, and and go from there so i hope that helps in terms of informational interviews they can be very powerful and really help you to kind of narrow down what it is that you want to be able to tell people in interviews through your resume and, and cover letters next question then what about va jobs do you need to have a military background I, I, since the va is a government organization i don't actually work with them because they won't, <laughs> they wouldn't pay me. Simple as that. Um, I don't think that you necessarily need to have a military background. 
I think one of the things that they often do and that people that I've spoken with seem to emphasize is what their relationship to the military has been. In other words, family members, or I've volunteered in some kind of a VA setting, or I have a particular passion for veterans, whatever it may be. But I, again, one of those things where you want to create as, as close a link as you can and, um, and work it through from there. I hope that's, that's a, of a little bit of help there. And then, oh man, got somebody old. I'm not even sure how they got out of bed this morning. But, and they're looking and going, gosh, I'm, I'm entering the spiritual care field for the first time and am concerned. <laughs> if, if you want to send back, one of the things that might be nice is if you were to say what your, con what your concerns are. I'm going to assume that it's, that it's age. And there's a couple of ways to look at that, I guess. One is if we think back to the pain, pain, pleasure idea, I'm going to assume that with that age comes seasoning and wisdom. And so I really want to let someone know that when you're hiring me, you are in fact hiring an adult. You're hiring somebody that more or less day one, you can turn them loose and I won't do anything to add to the troubles of your in basket. Um, so that, that would be part of how I would look at that. I think the other things that impact that oftentimes is, is how, how we approach it. In other words, if I sort of look old and I act old and, uh, or older, I won't say old, I guess, then that's going to have an impact. Um, and so I, I would want to be, I would want to be youthful, I guess, in a way, in terms of my appearance and my energy um, and my ability then to share my, my wisdom and, and keep someone comfortable with that idea that I, I can function independently. The other, the other things that I may look at would be, I would be looking for environments where um, people are older. So I would be looking at continuing care retirement communities. Not that everybody's old, but I may be looking in, in palliative care settings or hospice settings or something like that as well. So I may be looking too where there's an aging population and actually seeing someone who's my age, 60, 65, for an 85 year old may feel kind of comforting. Um, and Again, sometimes just because of that age, a little graying, if you still have hair, which I don't, um, can lead people to, to having a level of com comfort, comfort and, and trust, just kind of inherent in that. Um, so I hope that helps there. Another question, how, how do you negotiate salary? <laughs> you may not like this answer, but I, I, I'm going to say basically that you don't negotiate salary. And that may seem a little bit odd, but for the most part, most organizations really don't negotiate. It's not like I'm going to go in and say, they're going to say, well, we'd like to offer you 55. And I'm going to go, well, I won't take a penny under 70. And then they're going to go, well, we'll go 62, five and split the difference with you. Yeah, that doesn't really happen. That's not, <laughs> that's not how it works. So sort of, back to the person perhaps that, that in terms of informational interviews. One of the ways, and this isn't negotiating, but it is, it is my preparation, it is doing my homework, is that I will simply ask other people who know what a competitive salary range is for someone with my background and experience. So I have a good sense going into an, org, into an interview, if someone were to ask me, what, what is it as far as a base salary that you're looking for? I, I have an answer for that. I've done my research and, and I know. And some of that you can get online, but if it were me again, I would actually re prefer to talk to people who are in the environment and, and just ask. And most people will give you some, some kind of idea 
And then with that, if I'm sort of finding, for example, that the number I'm hearing or sort of the range I'm hearing most of the time is, you know, 46 to 52 or something like that, I may, to my own, <laughs> to my own benefit, I may, I may talk to people more in terms of 48 to 53. I might move it up a little, not give them that lowest number, but anticipating that perhaps they will do that. And I would never also in talking salary with somebody, I would try to avoid just giving a number, but I would give a range so that someone has some, something more to work with um, and, and go from there. So again, I would sort of lose the word negotiate, but I would do my my would do my homework, and I would know what's a reasonable range for me to be working within, expecting, and, and asking for. And if somebody's way below that, that that will tell me something as well. Okay, this may be back to the other question of I'm 65. This question is, I'm concerned that a potential employer will write me off because I won't be able to be on the team for 20 years or more. Yeah, okay, I, I understand that. And it's unfortunate because that's an illusion that organizations work with, that we do as human beings. I hire you and you're going to be with me forever. <laughs> yeah, good luck with that one. In today's world, um, doesn't happen. Not very often. And so part of what I want to do is, again, look at that and say, given my age, what are my strengths? Yes, perhaps I won't be here for 20 years. We don't actually know what's going to happen in the next minute. So maybe none of us will be here in 20 years. Um, but while I'm here, you're going to get the max contribution. You're going to get the most benefit. And so part of, part of what I'm, I might really be asking someone is, is I might want to try to turn that into a question and just simply say, what it, what is it that can be my biggest gift to you in other words what i'm what i'm looking at in a way is saying if you had somebody who pretty much ran ran trouble free for 3 or 4 years maybe longer how much value how much more valuable perhaps is that than somebody who's here for 20 years but they're a pain in the butt for most of those 20 years um so I would really want to look again and, and, and turn it into a strength as best I can. Then the other thing that I'm going to have to acknowledge for myself is that some people will just look at that as a bias and they won't look at me because of that. And I just go, okay, not a match, move on. Not everybody's meant for everybody else. Um, it can be like dating. You know, we, we can meet for coffee and we can go, wow, you're a nice person. Wow, I'm a nice person. But yeah, we don't click. So let's move on. And it can be the same thing here. If, you, if they've got a bias, you actually are better off walking away from it rather than having them sort of play that out with you after the fact. But I would again look and say, what is it that I bring? Do I have a great attendance record? Am I in really good health? Am I, am I flexible because of my lifestyle, perhaps an empty nester, and I don't have kids and a lot of other things that would impinge on other people's schedules, and I don't have those obligations? So, again, keep looking at what are the things that I bring because of my circumstances that perhaps other people don't. Oh, do you have a recommendation for people proposing to an organization that spiritual care would be useful for them? That's part one, and that is proposing that they have a spiritual care need when they don't currently have spiritual care. Okay, so it's like, all right, let me see if I can create something, an opportunity here for, for someone. Um, yeah, so first, first of all, you might want to work with them if they're willing to to identify what needs what needs they do have. That is, um, and and will that will they yeah and just kind of get the language and get an understanding of what some of the, what some of those needs are, um, and then and then from there be able to talk more about how you might be able to meet those needs. So you have to, first of all, look and say, 
do do I even do I even use the word spiritual care? And perhaps I use more a phrase like um, care and counseling needs. Um, and some of the some of them may be spiritual. Some of them may not. Be. Um, some some of the things that you might get into with somebody in this case too might be more of a of a value add. In other words, depending on the environment. Um, are there things perhaps that, that their, their organization, their patients, their residents, whatever the setting is, might value having that's, that is not now currently offered? Um, simple example for, is my mother who's 94 and lives in, she has Alzheimer's and she lives in a, in a, on a skilled care unit. But one of the things that she still appreciates is someone who comes by once a month and, and offers her the Eucharist. And that's still in some way that's unknown to us, but works for her, touches her. And so you're looking and going, are, are there gaps in the services that are being provided that might be meaningful for people? And so I, I want to look at that. I also may want to look at with them and say, I need to take this incrementally. In other words, you can't move more quickly than the slowest person that you're working with moves. So I can't try to sell you a whole full-time chaplain, full-blown spiritual care program. What maybe I can sell you if you don't have it yet is um, doing a, a Sunday morning service or something like that. And um, so you just kind of figure out where do you have needs? What are, what are some of the priorities that you have? And let me talk about how I might be able to address those. And, and you start out perhaps in a, in a small way um, and, and build from there. And actually, if, uh, well, on any of these, but certainly on that, if you'd like to talk further and more specifically about what you actually are thinking with that question, I'd, I'd be happy to do that with you because that whole idea of people creating their own positions is intriguing to me. And, and I, I think it's very uh, it's very cool. Okay. Thank you, Richard. We're, our time has come to an end, and we appreciate the presentation today, and thanks to everybody for joining us. As a reminder, if you've not yet signed up for the remaining webinars in this series, you can do so by visiting the ATP Academy webpage. You'll also find the recording from today's webinar, as well as the slides, and the documents that Richard uh, referenced. We'll be uploading those as well later this week or early next week for you to have access to, and we look forward to seeing you in future webinars. Thanks and have a wonderful day. Thank you.